Hi everyone and welcome to the Comic-Con at home panel for Amazon Prime Video and IMDb TV Presents. I'm Tim Cash and today I'm going to be speaking with the cast and creators from some of Prime Video and IMDb TV's biggest titles including The Wheel of Time, Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.01 Thrice Upon a Time, Leverage, Redemption, SOZ and I Know What You Did Last Summer. As well, coming up, you can look forward to some really great exclusives in store that you at home will be the first to see anywhere in the world. So sit back. This is the best seat in the house. Welcome to Comic-Con and let us welcome our first guest. Joining me right now is the showrunner and creative force behind the year's most highly anticipated fantasy series, The Wheel of Time. Please welcome Rafe Judkins. Rafe, thank you for being here. Welcome to the show. Hey Tim, thank you so much. It's, it's, it's great to be here. Where are we talking from? Where are you in the world? Right now I am in Prague, Czech Republic. I am in, I am actually in the chair that I sit in when I read Wheel of Time. It's no secret I've been looking forward to talking about the Wheel of Time for a while. To give everyone some context, this is not just a, a, a regular TV series, right? It is based on undoubtedly one of the most enduring and best-selling fantasy series of all time. I mean, the numbers uh, are astonishing. Over 90 million copies sold worldwide, which is a, which is a lot of zeros. Uh, take us back to your origin story with this project. What's your personal connection to uh, Robert Jordan's epic story? And why was this particular project one that you wanted or felt you needed to be involved in? The Wheel of Time was actually something I read when I was younger with my mom. It was this book series that sort of connected us to each other, especially after I came out of the closet. It was this this thing that let us each see what it's like to be a person who's different in the world. You know, her as a woman in, in a Mormon family um, and me as, as a little gay kid in Utah, like we, we could connect over this book and the women who were inside of it, who had to be themselves in this world that was very different. It's like your, your own biography should be turned into a movie at some point. <laughs> no, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. <laughs> no one wants to watch that. But, um, but yeah, no, so the, the book series was always like very near and dear to my heart. And, and I always thought it would make a great television series. So it was the one that I, you know, was always sending emails to my agent about. And she's like, I don't know what that is. Like, I've never heard of this thing. Just pay attention to all the stuff you're working on. And I was like, the wheel of time this is for real, like this is going to be a really meaningful show and I believe in it and just kept chasing it until until finally Sony got the rights and then we took it to Amazon. How long are we talking? I mean, when you talk about the Wheel of Time, as we realize time is a very long thing, how long has this project been in your life? <laughs> this project has been in my life for what, what feels like forever at this point. <laughs> um, I had read the books when I was way younger, but then um, I first came onto the project with Sony back in 2017, I think. Okay. And then we started shooting in fall of 2019. So most of us now, I mean, it is a continuing joke on the show of us all feeling like we have pretty much given our lives to this project at this point. There's a great lesson in perseverance there. The series spans 14 books and, you know, welcomes readers into really one of the richest worlds ever created. I feel like I'm being dramatic, but it's Comic-Con and I mean it, you know, at its core, sure. this is an adventure story full of twists and turns, but one that also weaves in a fascinating and very unique mythology. For the uninitiated, um, can you tell us a bit more about the story and mythology of the Wheel of Time? And then this is a big question for fans tuning in. How closely will the show mirror the story in the books? So, I mean, you know, summing up the wheel of time for the uninitiated is is a difficult thing to do. But the thing Good I always luck. think of yeah. is, yeah, is that it's sort of you know it sort of sits in the in the fantasy pantheon as that connective tissue between Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. Right. You know, it was one of the first fantasy projects that really took you into this unbelievably expansive world and created more POV characters than you usually see in fantasy books up until that time. Obviously. I want to stay as close to the books as we possibly can. You know, these are are really beloved books, but they also, I love them. There's a great story there. We want to tell it 
And we want to tell it in the way that's best for television. Like this really is a true adaptation of the series. So there will be a lot of things that are different from the books, certainly. But it, I think it always stays true to the heart of the books and the spine of the storytelling. You mentioned something super interesting about this show having characters with POV. Uh, a point of view. Break down why that is interesting when it comes to the world of making television shows. I think one of the great things about TV is that it lets the audience bring these characters into their homes and into their lives and you really think of them like friends. You know, you want to see what happens next to them. You you feel comfortable being with them. And I think that the best fantasy series do that as well. And that's why some of them have translated really well into television. The reason that I always chased the wheel of time and really believed in it as a TV show is because I think the characters in it are exactly those kind of people that you keep wanting to come back to. And the author, Robert Jordan, was really careful about giving each of them a very full interior right. life and agendas. You know, they're always working towards something even if it's not necessarily working towards the story he's trying to tell all of those characters want something and they push for it and i think that makes for the best television which means casting is so important with a show like this with characters that are so beloved i was running down the cast list on imdb and like one word to describe your cast is is global there's just so much diversity in so many different ways why was it important for you to bring in such an international cast to to take on these roles the Wheel of Time has always sat as as the most diverse fantasy book that came out in its time. And I think when you're adapting it to be on television today, we also need to do that in order to honor the books that are there and make this the most diverse fantasy TV show that's been on television before. So I think that that's something that's been really important to me the whole way through the process and, and bringing in all these people from these different parts of our world is letting us build the worlds within the show too. And it's, you know, it's just exciting when you sit down to dinner with Alvaro Morte from Spain and Priyanka Bose from India and Rosamund, like it, everyone just comes together in Prague and, and makes this, this thing more than it would be without them. And let's talk about Rosamund for a second. I mean, we all have a favorite Rosamund movie. When you're casting for kind of really the main role of Moiraine, are you looking at different actors' works? Are you going back through their kind of movie catalog and spotting pieces that remind you of Moiraine? Like what's the process and, and why did you land on her? When you look at a character like Moiraine, she's so iconic, not just in the Wheel of Time books, but in the whole world of of fantasy and genre, you need someone who just feels that part and believes it 100%. And that's the thing that was most important to me. I think that these books and, and fantasy shows in general have the potential to really transport you to another world if the people who are in that world believe in everything that they're doing and the things that they're saying and the things that they're seeing. The first time I got on the phone with Rosamond, I could just tell from the way that she spoke about the character of Moiraine, that when she had read that first script, it just hit her that she understood this woman. And when I talked to her, I knew that she was the only option for this character because she understood Moiraine kind of in her bones in a really fundamental way. And, and that's the foundation of, of this whole show and this whole, whole world working is that you believe the characters that are there and Rosamond is like the best foundation any good show could ever hope for. What was something she said to you in that conversation that you remember that you can share with us where you were like, okay, this is, this is Moiraine right here. It was, well, I'll set the scene for you. I, we were on a writer's retreat um, in Bali uh oh, glamorous to, yeah yeah it was very glamorous i mean we were we were in the jungle though we were meeting with um you know people who believed in past lives and shamans who sort of read your past life just to get everyone in the mindset of it and i'm talking to rosamond and it's on a really weak connection and a horrific thunderstorm and i was just like this is going to be a disaster like i'm going to keep dropping in and out like there's no way this is going to work and then her voice just came through the phone crystal clear and i remember the first thing she said to me she said rafe i know this woman i can be this woman and i will never forget that because it was the first words that came out of her mouth and you could tell she was just so passionate 
about this character and this story that she didn't even really want to talk about anything else. It was just Moiraine was the only thing she could think of and talk about. I'll never forget that call in that Lynn. <laughs> like that touch. I'm so happy I asked. Listen, I said this earlier, right? But this is really a massive world building series. We're, we're talking a literal ton of locations, characters, creatures, but also cultures from fans uh, to immerse themselves in. Behind every great showrunner, there is an even greater team, from what I've heard. Let's talk about your team for a second. Who are some of the people you're working with to bring this all to life? I am just so lucky with this show to have an unbelievable team with me. From our producer, David Brown, who did Outlander, our EPs, Mike Weber and Marigo Kehoe, who did The Crown, uh, The Queen, everything good you've ever heard of. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the writing staff too. It was just really important to me to find people who brought very different kinds of storytelling to the show. Um, my number two on the show is a woman named Amanda Kate Schumann, who, who is an incredible writer who doesn't really like or care about fantasy at all. And so she always made sure that our characters felt authentic and real. And our director, of course, Uta Brieswitz, who is incredible from Westworld and Stranger Things and every show that you've watched and loved, she's directed. And, and she came in with such a strong vision of what this world could look like and how to capture it again in a way that felt really, really grounded. It must be interesting to show on a project like this because there is such a diehard fan base of so many of us who know these stories and much like you feel feel uh, kindred spirits with these books, so do we all. So it makes us very harsh critics. Talk to me about, you, you mentioned a great word, authenticity. Um, it is something that us fans are so grateful for when it's done right. Uh, how important was that for you? Because it's brilliant that you bring up a perspective of someone that's not into fantasy to keep authentic and grounded, yet at the same time, someone like yourself who has been married to these books for so long. I think it's really important to find that balance around you all the time and have, you know, I always want to hire people that challenge me and sort of say, is this the right way to do this? So you can really stick true to it. So we had the same thing. I mean, we had, you know, people who had basically the seminal moment of their lives was reading the wheel of time in the writer's room Love and then it. people who'd, who'd never read the books. And so I think that balance really lets you remind yourself of the things that are important in there, the things that ring true and not get too tied into the stuff that actually makes the adaptation worse than it would be because it's sort of fundamentally breaking things just to deliver them exactly as they are to TV. The Game of Thrones finale taught us all as viewers kind of what happens when you run out of books. Now, I still love that show, uh, and but there's so many, you know, everyone's so divided. With 14 books, are you ever in danger of running out of story with The Will of Time? I mean, I, I feel like my danger will never be running out of books. Right. I think it's more, you know, the challenge that we face is how do you tell this story the most cohesively and the most coherently in what is a reasonable number of seasons of television. Right. So it's something I really set out to right from the beginning. I think you really need to know the end of your story when you start telling it. I think that's true for television, even though it's serialized and goes many years. Like I sat down and broke out what I thought eight seasons of the show might look like before I started writing the pilot, because I felt like you have to build in this knowledge of where you're going and how you're getting there from the very beginning in order to tell the stories the best you can. But let's talk thematically for a second. What do you think sets The Wheel of Time apart from other fantasy series out there? And, and what do you think fans are going to enjoy the most about it? You know, I think the thing that always defined Wheel of Time was, was both its its characters and its world. And those are the two things that I try to stay the most true to because those are the things that drew people in and made them read these books over and over again and give them to their friends and come back year after year for 14 full novels. And so the, the specialness that exists in those characters and that world, I think that's my job is to figure out how to most effectively bring that to TV. And I think thematically, Right now, a, a story that is really about balance is something that's meaningful in the world. So I think with our world being very divided and hyper-polarized, it's actually, it's really refreshing to see a fantasy series that is not so much 
good versus evil as right. as balance versus imbalance. And I think that that, uh, you know, I think that 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 is a message that's worth writing about right now and something that, that that is really meaningful. This all just moved fast and I thought we're already at time and time is something I guess we got to respect, especially when talking about your show. Um, before you go, I know you've brought something um, along with you today to share exclusively with the fans at Comic-Con at home. Uh, I promised everyone at the top of the show some great surprises. So uh, Rafe, the floor is yours. Go ahead. What are we about to see? We are about to see the first teaser poster for The Wheel of Time. I don't want to say anything more about it until they see it. I feel like it, it says it all. Well, this is it right here. Let's break this down because you've put this out here so we can talk about it. Get into the details with me. What exactly are we see? I think fans of the book will recognize this as a very iconic moment in the eye of the world. And I think what I like about it is that for people that don't know anything about the books, this is a moment where you see our lead, Rosamund Pike, Moiraine, looking back over her shoulder and saying like, you don't know what's through here, but come along for the ride. And I think that's what's so fun about these books and why people love them is not necessarily that you need to know every specific of what's in them, but you know that 90 million people have read and loved this thing. And if you walk through that door, you're coming into something really exciting and special. And what a great um, idea to use this as the poster for it, for both uh, fans who are initiated with the show and brand new uh, eyes and ears as well. Rafe, honestly, thank you so much for joining us. I had such a wonderful time chatting with you. I know we all enjoyed and appreciated you coming here to talk about the Wheel of Time. Honestly, cannot wait until November, right? November. November. The Wheel of Time is coming your way. And it, it was nice to meet you too, Tim. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks, Rafe. Thank you so much. I'll let you go back to doing what you do. Okay, thanks. We'll talk thanks. to you soon. Now, like so many of you here today, I have been a huge fan of our next title for a long time, and I'm honored to talk about and celebrate the Evangelion franchise's latest movie, which is also its grand finale, Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.01, Thrice Upon a Time. Joining me today from Tokyo, looking incredibly dapper, may I say, the creator, screenwriter, and chief director, Hideaki Anno. Hideaki, this is an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you today. It is great to have you here. Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.01, Thrice Upon a Time, is the fourth and final chapter in the new theatrical edition of the Evangelion franchise. Now, since the TV series first aired in 1995, Evangelion has had a significant impact on Japanese pop culture and the anime genre worldwide. Now, this legendary property returned to us in a new series of movies, Evangelion New Theatrical Edition in 2007. Well, now, its fourth and final movie will premiere globally on August 13th EST as a director service movie exclusively on Prime Video. How do you feel? about the finale of Evangelion being released globally. Now, it has been 26 years since the Evangelion launched and people across generations and countries love and live for the franchise. What is it do you think attracts just so many fans all around the world?あの、
Beautifully said. Now, I heard uh, you actually continue to work on Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.01 thrice upon a time after the theatrical release in Japan in March and actually revised some of the scenes for the version which will launch on Prime Video. Can you talk more about what audiences can expect from the brand new revisions? あの、時間さえあればクリエイティブ日本、日本語 もう一回時間があったので、あの、so I've always been fascinated with the way creative minds like yours work. We just spoke about the end. I'd like to talk a little bit about the beginning. Did you already decide on what the finale will look like when you started producing the very first film? あの、少しずつ形を変えていって、ま、今回の終わり方に、ま、行き着いた感じ。行き着いた、行き着いた感じですね。なんかそこに行っちゃったっていう感じですね。これはもう当初から予定していたことで、あの、ま、ディティールというか描写
Trust me, this is not one you're going to want to miss. Hideaki, this was an absolute honor. Uh, thank you for joining me. Also, thank you to all of you so much for tuning in. One last thing. Hideaki, any last words for all the fans watching all around the world at home at Comic-Con right now? ま、その、ドメスティックな作品がwell, on behalf of myself and everybody that you have entertained for so many years, we thank you so much for your time today. Hideaki Anno, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up on the Prime Video Presents Comic-Con at Home panel, uh, we'd like to introduce some special guests from IMDb TV, which is Amazon's free streaming platform. Now, for those of you who don't know or are new to IMDb TV, it is a free streaming service that's available as an app on Fire TV, Roku, Android TVs, and many other connected devices, as well as a free channel on Prime Video. And if you're anything like me and my guests right now, we all love us some free. Well, joining me now from the IMDb TV <laughs> original series, Leverage Redemption, please welcome actress and director Beth Reesgraf and actor and director Noah Wiley. Beth, let me hit you with the first question. Okay. You play Parker in the show, but also for some reason, you decided to give yourself even more work and make your mm -hmm. TV directorial debut. I think that definitely deserves a round of applause from everybody. Uh, and you definitely made it a really special one. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Let me fall back. You do the work because you love it. Uh, I'll let you introduce. What are we about to watch? Okay, we're about to watch a clip from the Bucket Job episode. You're going to see uh, the team get to know a little bit more about Mr. Blanche, our librarian. And I want you to enjoy. What do we know about her, Mr. Blanche? Uh, town librarian for the past 30 years, never married, no passport. The guy really doesn't like to go far from home. He's only been in the news one time 10 years ago when they tried to shut down the library. Mr. Blanche led the charge to save it. I guess there's a lot of Maurice's out there. All right. Well, we know he likes to read, so... Yeah. Go check on, do your thing. Go do your thing. Do you know what that is? Do you know what this is? This is a 386 gateway, 2000 PC. What the flap? Try this. Oh, you gorgeous antique. Sick. Okay, uh, according to the library network, here is a list of all the books he's taken out over the years. Whoa. What? That's. A lot of books. 10,000 over 30 years is about one a day. Can you narrow it down just a teeny bit? Okay, breaking it down by the card catalog, it's mostly fiction, uh, mystery slash detective, action adventure, horror slash fantasy, paranormal romance. Guy checked out Shogun a dozen times. Things like a brick. Must be an Olympic level reader. What is our story gonna be? For our librarian to be hero for the day. I don't think a sprawling saga of feudal Japan is gonna work for us. <laughs> Although I do have a really nice kimono. Mm. So do I. <gasps> Beth, I mean, you did it. You've peaked early. You just put LeVar Burton in a uh, scene. Does the atmosphere change when, you know, Geordie LaForge, LeVar Burton walks in a room? Did you guys witness anything? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think everybody got goosebumps and we all immediately felt like children again, listening to him on Reading Rainbow. I mean, right. it was pretty magical. When you say no, like... Oh, absolutely. No, it was, it's, I would met LeVar before and I just find him to be the most entertaining, most generous, warmest guy that you could ever want to hang out with. He, he elevates every room that he's in. I mean, if he knew the amount of times I would take my mother's headbands and put it around <laughs> here and just try and do it, I got to admit to it. It's so true. Beth, let me ask you this. As a first time TV series director, um, what was your process like to prepare for this episode? And is it like a, is it a different kind of nervous? 
my process on this was fast and furious, to be honest, because you don't get a ton of prep time when you're also in the episode. But I had a lot of generous, amazing artists around me to support me, including Noah Wiley, who was actually directing right before me. And he shared a ton of amazing tips. He was super helpful, very generous and kind. And Dean and the whole crew, you know, I've known everybody for, well, gosh, I don't know, uh, over 10 years now. And wow. so they've always seen me with my camera. They knew I was a photographer first. And there's always been that energy of support and love for what I do as a photographer. So it was no different when I was able to step into this role and, you know, the prep squeezing things in here and there. Noah actually did me some favors in his episode by... Um, tweaking things a bit so Parker could be present, but maybe not fully present. So I could run off and take a meeting and then pop back to set. So we pulled a couple fast ones um, to make it all work out, but it was, it was a blast. Noah, I gotta ask you as an actor who also has directed, why do you think so many actors, including yourself in TV shows or, or film, make that transition into the director's chair? Uh, I think actors make very good directors because they tend to be very good communicators and the longer that they've been doing it and the more directors that they've worked with, the more they've picked up a sort of technique that becomes very film friendly, especially when you're working on a tight schedule with a limited budget. And also it, it doubles and quadruples your chances of, of employment if you can right. still generate and come at this business from another vector. It's, right. Uh, Smart thing. <laughs> Do you remember when Beth came up to you and you offered her advice? What was that advice you gave? Uh, I think probably along the lines of stick to your guns on stuff. You know, you have a tendency when you're to be so grateful for the opportunity and rightly so because it's a wonderful opportunity to be given that you tend to acquiesce on stuff all the time to be a good team player. And my advice was, you know, fight for your show. You know, it's your show and you, you don't have to be you don't have to give up before you've pushed it to see how far you can take it, either on casting or getting the location that you want, or just, you know, sometimes the first answer is no. And if you keep asking the question, you can actually get a yes out of it. Awesome advice in general, to be honest. Beth, uh, you're not just directing LeVar Burson, but also Christine Kane, Noah Wiley, Gina Bellman, all seasoned vets, and also uh, fantastic newcomer, uh, Elise Shannon. Stepping behind the director's chair, did you learn anything new, not only about the acting style of your castmates, who you know so well, but also about your own uh, work as an actor? It's really interesting to me because when you're in it with such talented actors as these, you you feel when a scene or a take works. And I think I try to really tune everything out and fully be my, you know, lock into my character as Parker. And I always can felt, feel if there's a bump of authenticity or most times I do feel that. And a lot of times it's running back to check playback to make sure the shot and the movement of the cameras was what I hoped it would be or, you know, um, something like that more than you know, everybody's process is so different and amazing, but we've all worked together now for, you know, the first few episodes, we just clicked right away. So we had that rhythm going. So everybody was different. Yes. But, you know, when there's more emotional moments, you're, you're mindful that you don't want to scream across, you know, the, the crew and the food truck to right. give a note. You want to be kind and run in and gently give a, a thought or two. Right. But, I know a Christian in the middle of a fight thing, if I get excited at the end of a take and I scream while it's still rolling, I know he loves it. You know, it's like we all kind of have different ways of letting each other know like you're doing great. So I think knowing all these guys pretty well by that point really helped just know there was a there was a nice ease to everything. And it's it's so interesting. I mean, Noah, like so many people watching, you know, we followed your work for years from a uh, few good men, Donnie Darko, W E R, and now uh, here in Leverage Redemption, you're the new face. You're the new guy, and not only as a new character, Harry Wilson, but also as a director. So, what is it like stepping into the Leverage world? Like when you move into a show that's been around, is it like your first day at school? And did the cast do anything special uh, to welcome you? Uh, it is a bit like the first day of school, you know, and. That the challenge presented to me was, can I come into an already existing chorus and lend my voice in a way that lifts the sound even higher or and doesn't sort of sound out of place? Right. And so uh, that was really all I wanted to do was blend in and 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 hit the ground running with this and get the show up and on its feet. They could not have been more welcoming. They were all amazing. 
uh, with me and very, very generous. That being said, you know, the real not to crack with leverage is the fan base, which is so loyal and so um, passionate about this show. They're the reason the show is coming back and it, um, and it grew the fan base in syndication. Once it left the air, it continued to grow. So I'm hoping I, I pass muster with them because they're going to be the real critics. Great answer. Beth, what was it like when uh, you all found out for the first time that Noah was going to be joining Leverage? <laughs> this is what we want to oh, know. Great. Not that guy. Watch your wallets. <laughs> We've all seen Noah's work and he's so talented and amazing. And then to get on set with him and see firsthand his comedic timing, he, how gracious he is with everybody. And then he can pull that emotion from out of nowhere and land the most heartfelt beat that makes you well up. So it was awesome finding out Noah was going to join us. And then to work with him, it just got even better. So yeah, it, he's the perfect addition. One of the perks is job, I get to watch things kind of early. And one of the great things about Leverage is the rhythm in the dialogue. How do you, I guess, balance both and juggle both and still effectively uh, create this best seat in the house for the audience watching. The show has a sort of visual lexicon, right? Like there is an actual Bible that they have, like this is kind of the style of what we do. These types of shots are great for these moments, but it's just a guide. And I think you have that in mind. So the, the style of the show is gonna feel like leverage if you do just those things, right? But because we're all super creative people and the scripts lend themselves to something new every single week or every single episode, you have all these opportunities to play with that, right? So all of us improving, playing off of each other, we'll come up with something new and then we all feel super comfortable with one another. So it's like, what if I did that? And what if you did that? And Gary to the count, can you get me if I do this? And how fast can I move? Can I go slow? Like it's such a collaboration. I think that is truly why the show it resonates with people because from the ground up, we love working with each other and we all collaborate and there's no there's not a single voice that's telling everyone how it has to be at all. It's everybody's coming together, trying to make the best thing we can in that moment. Which is tricky because it's a very tricky show to pull off tonally. You know, it deals with extremely sophisticated subject matter, but with a very light touch and a kind of human attitude. So you're conscious when you're directing about, you know, is this undercutting the stakes? Am I going to be sorry that I'm playing this moment as levity? Do we need to pay more attention to, you know, the dramatic aspect of the storyline or conversely, this is where the audience needs to take a breath. We need to get out of this a little bit. We need, we could use a little improvisation here. And Beth's right. Everybody's been doing this show for so long and knows each other so well that when you're looking for a comedic button, it's a, you know, it's a buyer's market. Everybody's giving you too much, you know, you just basically get, you get the, a little you know, competitive sometimes with the that's it. In a very healthy way. You know, I've been on competitive sets before and I've been directed by my co-stars who use it as an opportunity to come up to you and go, you know what? You've always done what I've hated, um, <laughs> you know, and they give you a note. It's like, uh, you know how you cock your head all the time and kind of stammer? Yeah. Let's not do that. And it's sort of a, an opportunity to air grievance. This wasn't that way at all. People <laughs> be so generous with each other. Love it. No, a big question. What was it like being directed by Beth? It was great. You know, every sh we sh Beth showed up for her first day and the entire crew were all wearing Team Beth t-shirts, which just shows you a little bit of the spirit of support that went into this and the family aspect that we were all working in. I would not have known that was her first episode. I told her that because she's just an artist. She's a natural artist with a natural eye and she's so gifted at getting people to trust her and engaging with them on the frequency that they need to be spoken to. And that's so much of directing. You just can't use, it's like parenting. You can't parent the same way to all your kids because all your kids are different. And Beth's sort of innate sense of what people needed in the moment uh, was really uncanny. And I've told everybody that, that, that she was the best asset of the season, um, figuring out that she's a player coach and, and going forward will be huge for this show. That's cool, Noah. Thank you. Well, Beth, it's only fair to let you return judgment. I would say bury him right now because he was so nice, but you do whatever you want. What was it like being directed <laughs> by Noah? I was really excited for Noah to direct. I couldn't wait. And then when I wasn't really getting direction from him, I was kind of like, <clears throat> excuse right. me, are you happy with it? Like, how's it going? <laughs> and, you know, there is this like wanting to be like, please the director. Sometimes that little thing will creep, creep out. Like, is it good? Are they liking it? Da -da -da. 
And then I learned really quickly that when he's happy, he just moves on and he doesn't, you know, that he'll know if he needs something and he's really gentle about it and was like, I don't know, you guys know what you're doing. Like, no, yeah, it's great. And they, it was just so effortless. So it was like, oh my gosh, this is so fun. Amazing. There's a love fest right yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, creatively, how much goes into the thinking of keeping the tone of the series consistent with the original, but also the balance of making it feel new car fresh? Quite a bit, obviously, because this fan base is has expectations. They, they love these characters. They're excited to see these characters. So maintaining a sense of fidelity to the mythology was extremely important, you know, and the actors were really good at maintaining a line of consistency for the people that they've been playing. You know, it was about 50-50, like how do we pay off the old and how do we bridge it into the new, wouldn't you say, Beth? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we also, from a character standpoint, are thinking about, okay, it's been eight years, so how, what kind of growth and change has occurred in these human beings? And how do we play with that? And, you know, Elise coming into the group as this young, spunky spitfire it brought a whole new energy as well. I mean, it's always kind of an experiment when you get in there and you you find those beats, but we all do know our voices very well. And I think it was really important for me in particular um, with Parker to not lose Parker because even though she's grown, she still has to be an adrenaline junkie who's a bit dangerous, who's unpredictable, but who knows exactly what needs to be done at any moment. We have all been the newcomers to something. I think so many people watching this are, you know, starting something new, starting a brand new year, getting out of what we just all went through. In your own careers, uh, Beth, I'll ask you first, when you were a newcomer, what was the best piece of advice that you got from who? And uh, do you still kind of, why does it mean so much to you to this day? Wow, that's a great question. I would say I fully related to Elise personally on her journey because I was sort of a newcomer when Leverage started. And I remember there was a this awesome um, <laughs> critic wrote <laughs> about Leverage and they wrote a glowing review about everybody and then, except me, and then there was a paragraph of how I would be responsible for the demise of this show. And I saw that at, you know, the morning of going to work. I'm a single mom at the time with a toddler. You know, I'm making it all happen. I read this and I was like, oh, I want to get, I'm going to get the show canceled. This was going downhill. No one's, go, other, I should just get fired. They should fire me and save everybody the trouble. So all that's going on in my head. I get to set, we're working, working. Dean comes over. He's like, hey, you okay? And I was like, yes, yeah. so I was totally fine. And he's like, what's up? And I go, okay, I think you have to fire me. I think I'm going to ruin the show. I think it's actually, yep, it's going to, you know, everyone else is doing great. I'm ruining it. He said, well, what are you talking about? And so he and John Rogers walk up to me and they go, stand right here. They come back. We do a couple of takes. They come over and they hold their phones up to me and they show me, you know, at the time Twitter was just starting. Like Twitter wasn't what it was. There was no Instagram. And they start finding little comments comments about what's this new girl doing well that's a little out of left field but we kind of like it and like they basically went to say if you're going to listen to the negative then wow. you have to listen to the positive and sure. be careful of the maybes don't let anyone tell you maybe that's not want like you've got to stick to your guns and be fearless and it might be wrong and you might get your ass chewed out in a in a review but at the same time, I think Parker grew into someone who kind of, you know, she grew on people. And I think had I listened to that review, I maybe would have normalized her, which would have been the worst thing I could have done. Right. So I think that was really great advice actually from Dean Devlin. It was really helpful. Well done, Dean. And that critic, yeah. I mean, couldn't be more wrong as we celebrate <laughs> the launch of a brand new show that Parker is still go. a huge part of. Uh, Noah, final question to you. You were once a newcomer. Uh, what was that piece of advice that you got? Who was it from? And why does it still ring true to this day? Well, there was a, a moment early on in ER's run when uh, George Clooney took the cast into his trailer and sat us, sat us, sat us down and said, um, you know, I've done a lot of pilots and none of them have gone to series. And uh, this one's going to be different. We're going to do it differently. We're not going to put a division between foreground and background, and we're not going to put a wall between cast and crew. We're not, we're going to take our work extremely seriously, but we're not going to take ourselves too seriously. We're going to show up on time. We're going to show up prepared. We're going to know our words and we're going to do it differently. And 
he was saying this to veteran performers like Anthony Edwards and Eric LaSalle yeah. and Sherry Strayfield. And he was saying it to relative newcomers like Juliana Margulies and me. But by setting the tone at what the bar level of professionalism and courtesy was going to be on the set, he just gave us a great gift that we operated under for the next 15 years. And I've taken with me on every other show I've done, which is you want people to be relaxed and you want them to do their best work, which means it's important for you to maintain a, a disposition that will help elicit that. And any deviance from that is going to hurt yourself, your spirit and the work in the long run. So that take your work seriously, but don't take yourself seriously by George Clooney, one of my hit songs. As told by Noah Wiley. Honestly, I'm so happy I, I squeezed that last question in. Uh, I really enjoyed chatting to you both. For everyone at home, Leverage Redemption is a funny, it is inquisitive, and dare I say, a much needed escape. The first eight episodes of Leverage Redemption are now streaming on IMDb TV. Now, the episode that Beth directs entitled The Bucket Job and several more episodes are set to premiere later on this fall. Make sure you tune in. I am sure you are all going to enjoy watching it as much as I have. Until then, Beth and Noah, thank you so much for joining us here. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Of course. <laughs> so right now we're moving into the back half of our Prime Video Presents Comic-Con at Home panel. And it's around about here. We're going to shift gears a bit. So, so far today, we've brought you some incredible series from the fantasy genre, anime and drama. But now things are about to get considerably more, let's just say hair raising as we close things out with not one, but two thrillers I can't wait to share with you. Joining me first and here to talk about his exciting new Amazon original series, SOZ, please welcome showrunner Nico Entel. Nico, welcome, great to have you here. Hi, how are you guys? Wonderful. You look like you're doing much better. What a beautiful background. Is that green screen or is it real? Both. <laughs> a little bit of both. No, I, I, I'm in Costa Rica. One of the great things about our line of business is that we get to travel to amazing locations. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's no doubt the same thing with this special SOZ as everyone's about to see. Uh, before we get into our conversation, uh, I know you wanted to do something very special for the audience at Comic-Con at home. This is going to be the first time anyone outside of the production team and a select few has seen this. So Nico, if you don't mind, I'd love for you to introduce what we're about to see in this exclusive. First time ever, I am breaking the embargo. I've been looking forward to this opportunity. I come from a documentary background. My first movie since of my father started The Son of Pablo Escobar and it kind of like jump started the narco genre. I feel partially responsible for all of the narco shows you've been watching lately. And I wanted to drop an atomic bomb on the genre. I wanted to do something like, after this, you cannot make another series with drug dealers for at least a decade. <laughs> so what better than getting together drug dealers and zombies? And what you're about to see is a short clip, a trailer of maybe the greatest, for sure, the craziest show ever to come out of Latin America. Estoy frente al penal de Lomas Altas, donde el día de hoy está a punto de ser extraditado el narcotraficante más peligroso de México. Imagine a drug. It turns an ordinary soldier into an unstoppable fighting machine. ¿Cuándo sales de vacaciones? Hoy. Alonso Marroquín está fugado de la prisión Lomas Altas. ¡Ya regresó el patrón, cabrones! They weren't killed, they were infected. They're highly mobile, they're out there. Llevo años cubriendo la guerra contra el narco y nunca había alguien sentido un caníbal. ¡Como la rabia!
Well, I mean, that intro was everything and that clip is definitely something you do not see every day. So, Nico, first thing that becomes clear is that SOZ stands for Soldiers or Zombies. I'm already sold on the name, but can you tell us a bit more about the story? Um, the story takes place mostly in the U.S. We travel from Mexico to the U.S. I don't want to give away a lot, but basically we ask ourselves with an amazing group of writers from both the U.S. and Mexico, guys who work on The Doors and Twin Peaks, but also on Mexican soap operas, kind of like a crazy combination. And we ask ourselves, where would the most wanted uh, outlaw in the world would hide? And the perfect hiding place we concluded is the U.S. because nobody will look for him there. Right. So our he our anti-hero crosses the border when escaping from prison in Mexico, and he hides in the U.S. And most of the show takes place in the U.S. And we have characters from both sides of the border. Now, Nico, I'm definitely oversimplifying here, but we've got narcos in the Mexican desert. There are soldiers and policemen trying to catch them. And then if that wasn't action packed enough, we're throwing in zombies for good measure. Take me back. What was the inspiration and where did that come from in bringing this story to life? Don't forget about the press, the VA, the VA and the U.S. Army. OK. The inspiration for the show was actually a supposed true story told to me by the son of Pablo Escobar. Legend goes that when his father was hiding deep in the jungle and his son was brought to visit him, they have to have the lights off at night because there were like army helicopters all around. And the son who was like seven or eight at the time was super bored. So the only thing he could do to entertain himself with a candles for the only source of light was doing a spiritism with his father's body bodyguards so i asked myself what if a drug dealer was calling the spirits of the dead and it actually work and that was the starting point to writing this crazy idea we have a little bit of everything and and basically it's kind of like a race all of these different teams are racing to get first to our anti-hero who's trying to escape and towards the end of the series, we have a, a very, very big ending, especially for Latin American standards, lots of effects, explosion, fighting, in which everybody gets together at the same place to his hiding place. So it's action pack. You know, obviously you spoke earlier on about working with uh, Escobar's son. As a documentary filmmaker, research uh, must be in your DNA. Where do you start the research with a show like this, which is more you know, based in the world of fiction? I actually, me and my partner, who is a, a very well-established writer, he wrote, among other things, Revenge of the Nerds. He's a legend. Okay, wow. Uh, we, we talked to a couple of PhDs in biology because we wanted to make the science behind our zombies believable. So I, I don't want to give anything away, but we did a lot, of home, a lot of homework, and there is a certain logic to how our zombies work, and, we, and, and also depending on how close you were to patient zero, you have different abilities as a zombie. Because basically the, the presence of the virus is stronger in those that were closer in the chain to patient zero. Now, look, in the recent years, right, we've seen all different kinds of zombies in pop culture. We've seen the fast ones, we've seen the slow ones, we've seen the smart ones, we've seen the not so smart ones. Where do the SOZ zombies fall on the zombie scale? Like how dangerous are they? And why did you choose to go that route? Many zombie shows and movies, including some of my favorite, it started with somebody waking up and the zombies were already there. So we don't really see the genesis of the zombies. So in this case, we decided to tell the story of why and how this happened. So the audience is going to get to see our zombies evolve throughout the season. What's your favorite zombie movie of all time? I love George Romero. Everybody loves George Romero. Yeah. Uh, but uh, most recent, I think uh, we, we, we all love 28 Days. Such a good <laughs> film. Yeah, we need the, we had 28 Days Later. We need more, 28 months, 28 years, 28 decades. Uh, I'm all for it. Uh, you assembled a great cast and crew for this project. Tell me about the cast and the production team behind the show. We have a, a cast that comes from both the US and Mexico. And I was very lucky. I am not Mexican. So in a way, I wasn't looking for the biggest Mexican stars, but I was looking for the best actors in Mexico. Right. And we ended up with some actors 
that actually come from uh, mostly theater work. And some of them, they don't even have like big roles, but in order to get them, it's like, look, I know you're amazing. I know you're a new genre, but we wrote this scene just for you. <laughs> so we, we have like an amazing cast. Uh, it's led by Sergio Perez Mencheta, who is actually from Spain. Yep. And he already played a Mexican in the amazing show uh, Snowfall. Gustavo. El Oso, yeah. I, I'm a huge Snowfall fan. You know, it's you know you have an amazing cast all the way around but like let's just talk about sergio for a second he has the ability to play an aspiring kind of luchador who's also a hitman as gustave and snowfall but then i don't know if you've ever seen this but the movie life itself where it's it's a series of like short films compiled together but that his ability to play the love and the romance and all the ups and downs that come with that in life itself beautiful movie that was the first time i saw him was that the same case with you and talk to me a little bit about what made him the perfect choice for mora Ken. first of all his charisma which he doesn't have to use as eloso because eloso is a lonelier character here he's right. the leader Right. And, and he's very charismatic and these people are willing to do anything for him. And the press is willing to do anything to get to interview him. And the Mexican army is the, willing to do anything to stop him. Most people don't know this. He's one of the most important theater directors in Spain. Mm -hmm. In addition to his genre TV series work, he has like some very serious obscure plays. Yeah. And he's very smart and he brings a lot of great ideas to the table. Like every morning I would arrive to set and spend like 15, 20 minutes tweaking things with him. And it was always such a great learning experience for me. We are in the presence of somebody who hopefully after the show is going to be one of the biggest stars in Latin America and hopefully will cross to the US because I think he's that big. He has that much of a screen presence and he's very well surrounded here. Uh, because we have uh, Horacio Garcia Rojas from Narcos Mexico. Yep. We have Fatima Molina from Diablero. Uh, and what we did with my co-writers, we tried to give every character a special scene, a special moment as a way of achieving two things. A, attracting great talent. Because if, if, if you, if you want to cast, as we did, the most important female actress in Mexico to only do two days as a U.S. senator, you have to write a scene that she's going to want to do. Right. But the other thing that this helped us building characters that each person in his gang, in the, Sergio's gang, each zombie, each zombie has a distinctive, interesting personality. Well said. My final question before my final question, so like my penultimate question, because I'm just going to sneak in as much as possible, is... You know, we've seen a lot of different versions of zombies. It's so important to a show, especially one like this, that even though it sounds uh, very far-fetched, it is grounded and it feels real. Uh, I'd like to tip my hat off to the special effects and uh, costume department for uh, the intricate details in the zombies. Talk to me about how you achieve such a fantastic look for the SOZ zombies. One of my more important decisions was working with only one director for every episode. Okay. His name is Rigoberto Castañeda. He did a, what is probably the most successful a horror movie in the history of Mexico. It's called Kilometro 31, a Kilometer 31. And Rigo was instrumental in working with me uh, in creating that zombie look and that zombie something I don't want to give away. And the, the, the wardrobe, the makeup, the, the zombie movement. And it took a lot of time and preparation. And I have to thank Amazon for that because they gave us the resources to have the time and preparation. I spent two weeks in a tennis court with an army of zombies rehearsing their moves. <laughs> That must have been fun. Must have been a lot of fun. Um, honestly, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, I told you, I think before we started, I'm a couple of episodes in. Honestly, I cannot wait to finish the season. I think one final question uh, for everyone watching at home. Uh, Nico, what is something really special and really unique about SOZ that sets it apart from other shows and makes it a total must watch? I think it works at many levels. First of all, it has elements from many genres. It's a zombie show, it's a drug dealer show, it's a horror show, it's a drama, it has a little bit of comedy. And I think that on the surface, it's very, very entertaining. But under the surface, it's also my ultimate reflection in the so-called war of drugs. I think there is a lot of politics there that don't take anything away from the entertainment factor. 
but I think there is more than just entertainment. I love the fact that we use some great uh, Spanish rock and roll classics on the soundtrack, some of my favorite songs. Music plays such an important part in, in all television shows and film. Talk to me a little bit about the music in this show and what was important to you. We have actually three generations of drug dealers represented for Marroquin, the leader of the gang, mm -hmm. who he's kind of like a rock and roller. Right. And for his scenes, we decided on some uh, Mexican uh, rock and roll classics, such as Molotov, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably my favorite Latino band of all times. Yeah. And by the way, I, I know a lot about Latin rock. <laughs> I, I did the documentary on Latin rock. I, I, I showed on that one. Uh, then we have a second generation or a second style of drug dealers, which are more uh, associated with the Norteño, the culture uh -huh. of the north of Mexico. And then... Uh, what, kind of, what kind of music is that? It's called a regional Mexican, like okay. banda music and narco corridos. Okay. And then we have the younger uh, members of his band, which uh, their wardrobe and their music uh, refers to like a Latino urban music, which is probably the hottest genre in the world these days. Massive. People like Barbani yeah, sure. and J Balvin and so on. And I'm a big fan of, of what's going on actually in the intersection between a Latino urban hip hop and Latino regional music. There is like a bunch of unknown in the US artists that are mixing both things and are doing amazing work. And one of the surprises we have on this show is like every episode on the credits, we have a special song that was composed especially for us by two amazing new Mexican artists. And you're gonna love it. It's something very original. You've never heard it before. It's the sound of the future. Listen, Nico, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Everyone at home, SOZ is coming this August to Amazon Prime Video in more than 240 countries and territories worldwide. That is a lot of people and a lot of people who I know are gonna love this show, Nico. Until then, thank you, showrunner Nico Entel for joining and also thank you at home for joining us. Thank you so much. And I hope that next time I get to do this in person. My man, I hope so. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay, we're closing out with a bang. Our final panel in Amazon's lineup is with the one and only Sarah Goodman. Now, Sarah is the writer, creator, executive producer, and showrunner of the brand new mystery thriller series, I Know What You Did Last Summer, which is based on the 1973 novel of the same name. Now, this is just one of many great shows Sarah has been part of. I mean, like, check this resume out. Sarah worked on Gossip Girl for a number of years, actually show ran and executive produced the show's much talked about final season, as well as shows like Outsiders on WGN, Rake on Fox, and a massive favorite of mine and Comic-Con's Preacher for AMC. And now she's here. Her, her, her career is now in the drain. Uh, <laughs> being interviewed by me, Sarah, lovely to meet you. How are you? Lovely to meet you too. Now, I've got so much to ask you, obviously. Let's start with why we are all here. I know what you did last summer. Uh, I remember getting excited when this new series, uh, I know what you did last summer, was first announced. Uh, so I got to ask you, from a showrunner, executive producer mindset, what initially inspired you to make this series and what was your motivation for creating it? Um, I mean, what else is there but the title? Right. I mean, even if you've never read the novel or seen the movie, that title just sticks with everyone. It gives you that pit of your stomach fear, because I think on some level, everyone has done something that they don't want other people to know about. You know, you know, you know me too well. <laughs> I hope you didn't kill anyone. No. I hope most of I hope most of our secrets <laughs> are a little more tame than that. Uh huh. But you know, I think there was for me the opportunity to do a show where everyone is guilty about, of something was could not be more appealing. It, it's funny. I'm probably going to have to say I know what you did last summer a ton just during this kind of short interview. Sure. You you can't be referring to the show title by its full name all the time in like texts and conversations. So amongst the cast and crew. What is the nickname for the show? It's just the initials, I K. Oh Jesus, <laughs> I K. Right? Uh, I K. W. I I can't yeah, help you here. Y L S. <laughs> I, I K know. W L Y S. Okay, fine. You, you, to be honest, I thought that would roll off the tip of your tongue. <laughs> but no. but it's no. easy to text. Yeah, it is. Right, it comes matter. up. Um, you know, I've seen just a handful of episodes so far. And from what I've seen so far, this series is a 
kind of loose reimagining of the novel that the film is based on. So we've got people falling into two categories, right? Those that are familiar with the franchise and then those who are brand new to it. What do you think fans of the film would enjoy the most about this new series? And then what should viewers who are new to the franchise expect? Um, well, I promise there's still a lot of blood. <laughs> so for fans of the film, uh -huh. there, there will be blood. There's also, I put little Easter eggs um, through the series, through the season for really those diehard fans. I don't want anyone to be disappointed, but you absolutely do not have to have seen the movie or anything else to be a fan of the show. We have eight episodes to explore these characters um, who you know, are not just running from a stalker. They also are having relationships and they're having issues with their families and they're dealing with their real lives. I know what you said last summer. <laughs> and I say it so much and so do the <laughs> characters in the show. But yeah, they, anyway, there's, there's more than just the mystery of who's after them. It's, it's very much a mystery of who they really are. When you're able to kind of conjure and devise where Easter eggs go, what's the thought process? How does that work as a showrunner? Because like too obvious is corny to like the diehard fans and too subtle isn't well, it's almost like a treasure hunt. So what's the balance? How do you find a balance with dropping Easter eggs? Oh, it's, it was rough, man. It was, <laughs> it was super rough because you don't want to do something that's obvious and, and takes you out of the show. Right. You want to keep it with our characters, with our show, and at the same time, give those little subtle hints. And so I think within scenes that it felt like it could be a natural part of the scene uh, and i saw those opportunities we let our characters do their versions of it right. we let our characters have their take on what those little easter eggs might be i i mean i can't really i'm not allowed to say obviously no. so it's obviously. very hard to talk about in the abstract um, I am that person when I'm watching a show and I've seen the, you know, like, for example, the original film in this, in this case, I'm the person that's like, oh, that's there because of such and such. And, and, and the people watching it, like, I have no idea what you're talking about. What was the thought process and the inspiration for creating an original cast and an original story for this series? Um, you know, I think the novel was of its time and the movie was very much of its time and yeah. the show... I wanted to make a show that's of this time. And right. so, you know, no one is just a jock. No one is just a smart girl. No one is just a bitch. You know, people are really layered and everyone has different, especially now, different pieces of themselves. They show to different people at different times and, right. and parts that are public and parts that are private. And I think um, they're much more diverse and, and, and people are more complicated. And I think the cast is very much um, representative of those kind of deeper layered characters. And so is the story. You know, every episode goes really much deeper into the characters. Every episode has a different point of view of what happened that night before the accident. So every episode, you know, reveals more about the characters and right. will make it much harder to figure out who's really after them. I just realized how difficult this must be for you doing this interview and like not giving away spoilers. Exactly. <laughs> it's so, it's like <laughs> carefully navigating your way through like a minefield. Um, Yes. You know, you know, right before this, I was talking to Nico Entel, who's a showrunner from a new show called SOZ, Soldiers or Zombies. And he's currently in Costa Rica shooting a new project. So like I realized very quickly that you both must have read the same kind of showrunner pamphlet about shooting shows in exotic <laughs> locations, because this series was undeniably filmed in Hawaii, one of my favorite places on earth, right? So how big of a role and in what way did the location of Hawaii play a part in the actual storytelling? Um, I think it's huge. It's huge in a couple ways. It's huge because it's everyone's favorite place. I mean, yeah. right? It's, <laughs> it's paradise. It's peaceful and beautiful and an escape from reality. And there's a whole history and culture that exists there that most people just never see. There's that whole other part of Hawaii that really lends itself to 
getting underneath the surface, which is what we're doing with the characters as well. And that danger is lurking in all of these places. And the other thing is, as you were there, so you know, there's no escape. No. I mean, there's no way out. I'm curious, you know, Hawaii is a beautiful place, but when it comes to production and making a television series of this scale, there's got to be some kind of like cons to shooting in Hawaii. You know, the weather for one, like the the unpredictable nature of the rainfall. It, is, is it, it's, it can't be the easiest place to film a television series. No, it was not. I mean, we had flooding. We got flooded out of a number of our locations. Yeah, we were on the cliffs with dangerously high winds filming <laughs> the cliffs with dangerously high winds. <laughs> <laughs> say less i get it 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 had its own horror it had its own horror built in you know it it was interesting you know when i look at your career and like the brilliant credits that come with it i wanted to ask in what ways did writing vastly different shows like on one hand you've got gossip girl which is teen drama romance and then on the other you've got preacher which is drama action supernatural comedy dark comedy horror comedy horror all of that rolled in How did all of that prepare you for this task with I Know What You Did Last Summer? You know, I think in a weird way, it was all of them coming together. So this show has drama. This show has has, uh, a lot of blood. (laughs) This show has violence. This show has that psychological stuff, though, as well, where the horror is imposed by people you know. Right. Um, And so I think for me, it was kind of a perfect storm, also in Hawaii, perfect storm, but exactly (laughs) of of those things coming together, because I like telling serialized stories. I think that's super fun. I love mystery thrillers and that I hadn't gotten to do. Um, So to be able to combine like that, this has some dark humor. Definitely. This has, you know, drama and it has some extraordinary storylines as well that that everything kind of came together um yeah to to make all of my fascinations and dysfunctions into one marvelous (laughs) there you go wow uh we are we you know we're running out of time uh we've got kind of uh, just enough seconds for a quick answer. Uh, so I'll do it like this. If ever you've ever been chased by a psycho killer, you know that you have to think fast on your feet and that's the same for a showrunner. Uh, so here you go. One final question. If you could describe the new series in just three words, what would they be? You know, th- I'm a writer. There's so many words, so many words. You get three. <laughs> uh, real, Uh huh. dysfunctional, and completely unpredictable. That was you, four, but one was you, an adjective. And you just described my family, but fair enough. The show- All applies. of our families. Yeah, yeah literally. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know about you. I'm excited to see the show in action. Sarah, do you have any idea when we can expect it to premiere? I am allowed to tell you that it is coming out October, 2021 on Amazon Prime Video in yes. all the territories. Yes. I promise you're going to be hooked. You will not stop watching. You will want to know who did it. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today, giving us some insight into what we can expect from the new Amazon original series, I Know What You Did Last Summer. Halloween's going to be great this year. Stay tuned for more info about this mysterious new thriller coming to Amazon viewers worldwide, as Sarah said it, this October. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. You better f- watch it. I promise you I f- will. <laughs> Well, that's it. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I don't know about you, but I have had an absolute blast talking to such a brilliant and creative group of people, the cast and creators of some of Prime Video and IMDb TV's most anticipated series. One last time, The Wheel of Time. Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.01, Thrice Upon a Time. I'm getting good at that. Leverage Redemption. SOZ and of course I know what you did last summer. I hope you all had a great time and that these conversations and the exclusive content we got to see as part of the Comic-Con at home audience has got you excited for the shows that are coming up. Be sure to follow the Prime Video and IMDb TV social handles for updates on when you can expect these shows to drop and until then thank you for watching. Take care. I appreciate you being here. Hit me up on social at Tim Cash and until next time Comic-Con Goodbye.